Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast and this episode's been a long time coming largely due to me being very busy being a researcher and uh, and not just getting enough time to put away to, to produce these podcasts and this podcast had some technical difficulties as you'll probably tell with the sound but I've managed to clean it up and make it presentable. Uh, Dr James Rudd I apologise for the long wait in getting this out and uh, I'm sure you'll be interested in what he has to say in particular um, some of the new work with cardiac traces and this is a kind of PET scan that really anyone with a PET facility could do so I'm sure you'll be interested in this. Meanwhile, if you've got some stories to tell, um, something of interest to the nuclear medicine and, and molecular medicine community out there, why don't you let us know? I'd love to hear some people talking about, for example, uh, PSMA uh, PET imaging and some of those new challenges or some of the new spec traces out there. So please get in touch with me at rob at newcast.com and uh, I'll, uh, I'd love to hear from you so that we can tell your story on the Nuclear Medicine Molecular, molecular Medicine podcast. My name is James Rudd. I'm a clinical cardiologist but also a researcher uh, from Cambridge, from University of Cambridge. Um, originally trained as a as a, a doctor and a cardiologist in Birmingham and London. And then, as I was saying, I worked for a short time in Australia uh, learning uh, cardiac imaging and, and geography. And um, most recently I've been working in, in the United States at Mount Sinai Medical Center for a couple of years with uh, Valentine Fuster and Zahi Fayad on uh, multimodality atherosclerosis imaging. 2009, I've been back in Cambridge um, setting up my own research group and my, I guess my primary interest is vascular and atherosclerosis imaging, some cardiac imaging, uh, but I've also been involved in work in the carotid arteries, in the uh, aorta with aortic aneurysm imaging and also in the aorta with rheumatoid arthritis vasculitis imaging. And my Clinical work uh, is along the same lines, so I work as a clinical cardiologist uh, seeing patients on a daily basis with uh, different um, heart complaints, mainly angina, palpitations, and I'm funded 50% clinical, 50% research, so it's a nice mixture of, of both things. Um, and um, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, um, I, so... Uh, on the podcast before, we've done uh, we've looked at vulnerable plaque um, mm. uh, with uh, particularly with uh, uh, looking at FDG and, uh, and and those other compounds. Uh, we're interested to see some of the work that, that has been done at Turku, uh, where they were mm. using FDG and gating the heart to uh, to look at vulnerable plaque. And and uh, yeah. you you published a, recently a paper. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. It looked at FTG, but it also looked at um, uh, uh, just straight um, uh, F18 uh, fluoride. Yeah. Um, so I'd be interested to know about how that paper went and, and, and what did sure. you do? So this was, um, I published uh, about 10 years ago, I guess the FTG st story started. I think probably we, we were amongst the first groups, maybe with Turku as well, to to come up with the idea of using FDG as a, as a marker of metabolic activity in atherosclerosis and we applied it initially in the carotid arteries. We showed that there was a reasonable relationship between the plaque FDG signal and underlying um, inflammation in the plaque when we got the samples at endarterectomy. And of course, uh, like many others, and I know you've interviewed um, Bill Strauss as well at, uh, from New York previously, and I worked a little bit with him, we, we wanted to apply this to the coronary arteries. Uh, and as a cardiologist particularly, I wanted to see if we could image the vulnerable plaque uh, within the coronary arteries. The problem, of course, as you know, is that FDG is taken up avidly by the myocardial cells themselves. So any signal that you might have in these very small artery plaques is swamped by my myocardial signal. So we played around and published a little bit trying to dietary suppression of the uh, myocardial signal, but that doesn't really seem to work particularly effectively. And then in collaboration with colleagues in Edinburgh, we set up a study that you're alluding to, which was just published in, uh, in The Lancet at the end of last year, where we set out to use sodium fluoride, as you say, straightforward vanilla 18F, and uh, we uh, set out in a group of patients with stable coronary artery disease 
and a group of patients with unstable coronary disease and used a, um, a similar protocol that you would use for bone imaging, so a circulation time of around 45, 60 minutes, very straightforward, static imaging, um, no dynamic uh, imaging. We did do gating of cardiac and respiratory movement. And what we were able to find, um, really exciting and surprising results, is that the sodium fluoride was in 37 out of the 40 patients that we imaged with uh, recent myocardial infarction, the sodium fluoride uh, really honed in on the plaque that we thought was the culprit vessel uh, that had caused the myocardial infarction. So that was exciting and that led us to believe that maybe this is a really nice marker of vulnerability within the coronary arteries, certainly better than FDG. But the other interesting thing is that we did some intravascular imaging of the stable patient group where we had a bit more time that weren't undergoing primary stenting. And we found that the uh, plaques that lit up with sodium fluoride in the stable group had uh, intravascular ultrasound features of vulnerability in terms of uh, you know, uh, high burden of lipid core, necrotic core, some outward remodeling, and thin fibrous caps. So that led us to conclude that perhaps we could image vulnerable plaques just after they'd ruptured in an infarct uh, post-MI group, but also maybe before they rupture in a stable angina group. Um, and uh, yeah, the, so the findings were very exciting and uh, we were lucky enough to get it published in a, in a good journal with lots of, lots of coverage and lots of impact. And so we're taking those studies forward by uh, imaging different patient groups, you know, patient groups maybe with um, uh, recent myocardial infarction, you know, different therapies and trying to work out exactly what the signal is due to. And we're also doing some ex vivo studies, as you might expect, with uh, in back in the carotid arteries where we can get tissue samples to see if there is any or what the underlying basis of the signal is, whether this is simply accumulation within uh, calcium, as you would probably expect, whether this is accumulation in areas of the plaque where calcification is actively happening, which is what we, we think. Because what we found interestingly is that when we did a, a straightforward CT scan of the arteries, we found obviously lots of areas of calcium on CT, but often there was no signal at all on the sodium fluoride. So it only seems to light up certain areas of calcified plaque, which is um, where we're hypothesizing where the action is happening, where the vulnerability, where maybe there's been necrosis and healing uh, is happening by calcification. Right, so in, in the, um, uh, the CTs, often the, uh, the calcium they find in CTs is actually an indicator of stable plaque rather than, exactly. than vulnerable yeah. plaque. So it's not a good indicator, but on, on your sodium fluoride, you're talking about active uptake. So That's right. So, uh, Some areas were completely inert with just, let's say, CT positive calcium, but nothing on PET. And also vice versa. Sometimes we would see sodium fluoride uptake, but we see nothing at all on CT. And what we think is happening there is that we have got areas of very, very small microcalcification, too small, you know, below the spatial resolution limit of CT, and we're picking them up in the very earliest stages where there's active exposure of hydroxyapatite and binding and mineralization going on, and we're highlighting that with the sodium fluoride. And another study we've got going, we're following those patients up for two and three years to see what happens to those areas, whether in fact they do become calcified on CT over time. Right, so, so your, your hypothesis that there's actually a window of time where those yeah. parks are vulnerable, where they're liable to rupture, and then they become stable. So if you've got a That's large right. area of, of uh, sodium fluoride uptake, these people are liable to have, a, have a, an acute heart attack? Is that, is that what you're the, saying? That's the completely unproven hypothesis, but yeah, that's what we, that's what we think is happening. Right. Uh, clearly, we need a much larger natural history study to prove that. But certainly in this snapshot of 40 stable patients, 40 unstable patients, that was the kind of story that we were getting. It was a good marker of a very recent event that had happened already, right. uh, which we saw in the post-MI group, who were having angiography you know, within the throes of the infarct within the first few hours. But in a stable group of patients with just common or garden angina, you know, no recent uh, heart attack, we did find these areas that were also lighting up. And then when we put the IVUS camera down, we saw that those lit up areas were vulnerable. So we think it also shows that, as you say, in that window, maybe that those plaques were becoming dangerous for the patients, even though they hadn't yet had an event. So really what you want is a longitudinal study where you're going to 
actually show events in these patients and then you'll be able exactly. to know whether it's predictive. Um, exactly. So that's very yeah. exciting because that means that mm. we know which group of patients to intervene, intervene aggressively, I presumably. Um, that's right, yeah. And, yeah. Well, well, and mean, work out... unproven. Right. But and the idea is exactly that. But what intervention are you going to do? What's, what's <laughs> the right kind of intervention? Is it... Is it uh, because there's, you know, there's some doubt around whether really stenting and things help. I mean, is it is it ultra aggressive medical therapy? Is it uh, is it stenting? What what's the right thing to do in people that are in this hyper dangerous situation? I guess. Yeah, I mean, the answer is nobody knows yet. But uh, the line that we have taken when we've been writing grants around this, just doing exactly what you just suggested, you know, following patients with very high levels of uptake, is not stenting. We d we think that would be too too much of a step change without any evidence really. So what, we, what we're suggesting doing is, yeah, intensive medical therapy, you know, going from a low or medium dose statin up to a high dose statin um, and, uh, you know, every other secondary risk factor modification that you could think of, aggressive control of diabetes, blood pressure uh, and seeing, you know, following the patients for events. Yeah, um, and, and, yeah and it's tricky. I, I mean, would you be advising aggressive exercise in these patients or not. I mean, it's, uh, you know, exercise is good in general. It is. Uh, uh, but is it good in these people? Uh, uh, we don't know for certain, but uh, uh, that, 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 that's, that's probably, you know, one further study down the line, you know, to see exactly which, which uh, lifestyle changes do work. But there was some earlier work ages ago now that showed that even aggressive lifestyle modification with no medications could lower the FDG uptake in your carotid and aorta by about 10 or 20 percent. Right. Over a one-year period, that was a study from South Korea. So even, you know, looking after yourself really well for 12 months was enough to reduce inflammation, if you like, in the arteries without any going near a statin. Right. Or, a, yeah, or a bi uh, gastric bypass or those other sort of right. interventions as well, I guess. Yeah. Uh, possibilities. Yeah. Um, I mean, and the, uh, again, with lifestyle, they're very much a cultural thing. Ha having worked in the UK and then coming here, and and having previously been here, the difference in lifestyle, I'm afraid, between the UK and Australia is dramatic. As our, I'll, I hate to say it, as our recent cricket team might uh, <laughs> might evidence that um, those kind of interventions really are vary a lot from place to place. And I, I mean, I like. I did some work in, in Glasgow, for example, and, you know, there's some big difference in lifestyles between places, and that kind of thing might have a factor. No, I think you're, I think you're right. I mean, Glasgow's got one of the highest rates of coronary artery disease in the whole world, so most of that is probably genetic, but, there's, yeah, as you say, the, I'm sure if you compare to, you know, 50 to 70-year-olds in Melbourne and 50 to 70-year-olds in Glasgow, there'd be a, a decent difference there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, well I, I know we've got a um, we've got a patrol in my surf club that have to compete to qualify for um, uh, every year for to, to, to get in. So they have to do pass a you know a fitness test in the surf, and all of them are over sixty. Um, really, some of them are over seventy even. So wow. uh, it's something you're not likely to see in the UK, you know. So not uh, surfing, but you know, in general, around here there's you know, there's 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 all sorts of options. But yeah, I've lived in Australia too, so I know there's certainly uh, there's a lot more emphasis on finishing work at five and going out and doing some exercise and you know a lifestyle thing. Yeah. So, so the um, mechanism you're thinking about for this get back to what we're talking about is, mm. is simply calcium um, uh, deposits. I mean, we used to have uh, you know uh, uh, phytate imaging, technetium phytate imaging for measuring acute infarcts, which was uh, believed to be calcium is it so it is simply that that you think that you're looking at or is it something else no no we think it's that so we think there's um, a vulnerable or recently ruptured plaque where there's been some uh, inflammation followed by necrosis and then the uh, the area will become calcified as a, almost as a means of the body starting the healing process so hydroxyapatite is exposed during that uh, during that process and that's where we get binding of the sodium fluoride so it's areas of calcium that are actively turning over you know in other words where there's ongoing calcification activity as opposed to the more larger uh, areas you might get on a standard cardiac CT which seem to be the whole artery encased in calcium and one could imagine that that has been there for a while 
that it's a fairly inert situation, there's little turnover of sodium fluoride going on. Whereas these recently rupturing or sorry, recently ruptured or about to rupture areas, we believe that there's a massive drive of calcification. Um, and there's some animal work to suggest this is true. You know, genes are switched on. Um, reparative genes in within smooth muscle cells and these become more like osteoblasts and you get a kind of calcification upswing and we think that the tracer is is highlighting those areas within the arteries. Um, how doable is this in other situations in terms of more general places replicating what you're doing? What special techniques did you use in terms of gating, particularly cardiac and respiratory gating? So we did, uh, the, the standard protocol up front is very, you know, straightforward, there's no fasting involved, it's a, it's a pretty low dose of, of sodium fluoride we use, standard kind of dose, probably five or six millisieverts total for the whole study. Uh, PET-CT, standard PET-CT in terms of, you know, four or five minutes per bed position. Uh, in terms of gating, we did, we did do cardiac gating, um, and I think that we've just got a, a GE690 PET-CT scanner. And it seemed to cope with it pretty well. It didn't seem to be a big, big issue. And in fact, the main reason we used the gating was actually so we could do a nice cardiac CT at the end of the pet acquisition. Um, so it's, it's, I, I imagine that this would be feasible to do even without cardiac gating, but it certainly does improve the image quality and the ability to localize the signal to an individual artery. Um, but some have ad advocated that it could easily be done without gating, and then you draw a large volume of interest around the entire heart and come up with a kind of vulnerability score, um, but you would know better than better than I whether the gating is, you know, a big issue. I think respiratory gating is is much more of an issue, but cardiac didn't seem to be too too so you, burdensome on the technologists. So you didn't do respiratory gating. We did initially. We started doing respiratory gating, and then we compared it with with some historic cases where we hadn't done it, and we really didn't see a difference. And it was actually quite a lot of extra work for the for the technologists to do in a busy kind of clinical service. So we we decided that it wasn't going to add anything to the studies. But I think in the future, if we have uh, we've got more protected research time now, we probably will go back to that. I think that would probably be the gold standard to gate both respiratory and cardiac, if possible. Right. Um, so um, uh, the, the gating that you used was a, was a chest band or was it like they did a turku with a pressure mask? No, it was a chest band, yeah. yeah. And simple ECG, uh, okay. ECG leads, cardiac. Ah, oh, okay. So and Standard uh, reconstructions and nothing, nothing fancy in terms of reconstruction, sort of standard time of flight, you know, that you get on the, on the G machine. Right, yep. Yep. Okay. Oh well. Uh, so that sounds like there seems to be a lot of work to do. You, to get to do this accurately and to do some studies, do you really need some larger cohorts, preferably multi mm. with preferably multi intervention. So, are you looking mm. for partners in, in 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 terms of future research projects along that line? We are. We are. Yeah. We've we've got a two or three centres in the UK which. Uh, which we're working with already, you know, obviously Cambridge and Edinburgh. We've got you know potential partners in in London as well, uh, who are very keen to get involved. Uh, as I say, we're doing a lot of ex vivo validation work with autoradiography to try and really pin down uh, exactly what is the underlying signal here, because um, you know, it's autoradiography is probably the easiest and perhaps the most accurate way of doing that. You know, on these large tissue samples you get out from carotid endarterectomies. And then, of course, animal models maybe with, you know, accelerated calcification and then treatment for calcification to see, again, what happens to the, to the PET signal um, over time, longitudinally, and with interventions. But yes, we are. We've, we've got a couple of clinical studies which are much larger, five or six hundred patients as opposed to 40 or 50. Um, and we are, we're always looking for, <laughs> for keen collaborators and, and partners to, to help us out with those. Yeah. As you know, most of the, the object here, most of the, most of the barrier to getting these things done is simply a recruitment issue. Yep. Uh, the imaging itself tends to be, you know, it's, it's fairly standard really for this tracer. So it's more of a getting patients uh, into the studies um, rather than a highly technical protocol, which is, you know, would put people off. Yeah, and, and it's not as though something, uh, it's actually something that would actually potentially be a benefit to... Uh, to volunteers mm. in this research, so it's so exactly. it, would, it wouldn't it wouldn't pose any ethics uh, hurdles whatsoever. I would have thought. 
There's, yeah, there's the issue of the radiation. Uh, so clearly, it had to go through IRB and things uh, in the UK. But it's, it was, as I said, it wasn't a, a huge burden. You know, it's less than a myocardial perfusion scan, for example, yeah. in our institution. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a big issue at all. I guess if for a longitudinal study, if you're following them up, maybe with multiple imaging time points, um, that would be more of a more of a challenge. But um, I, I don't think it. You know, we didn't get any particularly negative feedback from other centres where we where we pioneered this as well. It's interesting how we're trying to get more and more sophisticated markers and figuring out things. And this is the case where you've gone backwards and just chosen the most unsophisticated marker whatsoever, and uh, it's done very yeah, well. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, we we yeah we went we went back to the literature really and thought you know what what is something that can really report on an area of pathology within the plaque that we think is very important. Um, you know, we've, FTG is 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 very good, and you know you've seen drug studies where you, the signal can be manipulated up and down by uh, different therapies. It's useful. Drug companies have you know have got some good benefit out of it uh, in terms of particularly the carotid arteries and the aorta, but the problem is in the heart. Uh, as as we've discussed already, you know, overspill from myocardium. Tricky uh, to do. And also, I mean, exactly, very tricky. And also, probably about half the scans, you know, uninterpretable in terms of the myocardial uptake. So yeah. you really have to, uh, you're, really, you're really up against it there with FDG. But sodium fluoride, really, you know, zero uptake into the muscles. So uh, the only thing we ever worried about was some uptake around the mitral valve apparatus where we had calcification. Sometimes that, that was hot. But in the main, uh, any signal that we saw was coming from the coronary arteries, which was uh, a nice refreshing change. Right, and and because you've got a good signal to background, things like gating and so on aren't don't have to be as precise as you have to do with the FDG. Exactly, exactly. FDG and, and other traces that we you know we've tried in the coronaries as well before. So, exactly. Excellent. That sounds like a great field of research, and uh, I encourage mm. everyone to get involved. Um, and, um, uh, thank you very much for taking your time, uh, and uh, and I hope uh, your weather isn't as hot as here, or I, I assume it's cold and over. And you've had terrible weather too. It's a, a, but uh, um, uh, good luck with your research, and thanks for being part of the podcast. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Any time. Great. Thanks. Thanks to James Rudd for that excellent interview. Um, uh, please let me know if you've got any ideas about podcasts about what you're interested in, um, particularly if you've got a story to tell, or if you're particular if you're heading down under to Melbourne, um, I'd love to hear from you and perhaps do an interview if you're heading in, to, in Australia's direction. So, uh, love to hear from you. Uh, keep in touch at rob at nukecast.com. See you next time.